Middle England. Most people will think that these are mainly photographs or predominantly photographs of a small town in the West Midlands. On one level that's the case, but the term Middle England has got to be seen generically. What it really means is this is the kind of England that most of us live in, the world of suburbia, the world of substations, people that are not famous, that are not picturesque. You know, they don't walk around uh, doing uh, maypole dancing uh, or uh, these kind of exotic English uh, kind of festivals. They're not strange, they're just normal people. And the world that they live in is the world that we all recognize. And most of the time, we just blank it out. We want things that are spectacular. We want photographs that are exciting. We want photographs of mountains, of sunsets, of white ponies on hillsides. And the photographs in this exhibition are not like that at all. They're just photographs of Middle England, the world that you and I live in. And I suppose uh, the photographs that I took between 1972 and 79 were an attempt to kind of document that. And that's why they were all taken mainly, all taken actually within walking distance of where I lived, of people that I knew, of streets that I knew. The main thing about taking photographs of people, from my point of view, is the spatial relationship you have with your subject, the kind of space that they inhabit, the kind of fluid of space around them. And that really uh, can be quite difficult to achieve. And what I mean by that is all of the photographs that I took were of the full figure. I've, I've almost never actually chopped a figure in half from the waist upwards. They were always taken uh, so the figure was either standing or seated, but all of the figure. And because they were cropped in camera, it's always important uh, when the photographs are reproduced that they're never cropped. Because if they're cropped ever so slightly, the figure becomes too large for the surrounding space. And the first photograph that was really successful in that regard is the photograph of Mrs Tate, where she's sitting in her front room. She sat on a chair, on the right-hand side of the photograph, and behind her is the fireplace and the ornaments on the wall. The other distinguishing aspect of the, about that photograph is, is that Mrs Tate is almost as if she's in a box, was a way, essentially, of trapping her, placing her in a space. And this aspect features right throughout the portraits. You find it in Mr and Mrs Seaborn. And the key in that particular photograph is that, that sliver of the corner of the room on the right-hand side, it sets up the box. You see it also in The Girl in a Hood, number two, where she was taken outside. But So there's a door to the right of her, and then behind her there's that kind of opening to what looks like a, an outside shed or a toilet, that kind of ziggurat of brickwork. And that, in the same way, whilst it was taken in a yard, actually works like an internal space. It kind of contains the figure. Another example... Uh, which is slightly different, uh, is Mr Jackson. And there again, uh, the figure is fairly kind of confined. But what's actually trapping the figure and holding it in, in position is that kind of patterning of the, the wallpaper behind and the carpet uh, on, on the floor. Most of the portraits were of, of people that I knew or that I saw around. There were exceptions. I mean, the, the boy at the cactus farm... I came, I came across a cactus farm outside Bridge North and, and he, I think, was probably the son of the owner and uh, I'd got the camera in the car and so I, I went in and took a photograph. Uh, you, when you use a 5.4 camera, you, uh, you are limited. You can't go out um, snapping people on the street. Um, you've got to have something where you're actually able to set up where you're, you're actually, in some measure, in control of the space. Not the figure itself, not the subject, but in terms of the space. And that's why almost all of the portraits are taken within a space. There are very few portraits of mine where 
there is deep space behind the figure. They are all kind of contained. And if you actually look at the photographs of Walker Evans or Diane Arbus, the same kind of application applies. Arbus used internal space in exactly the same way. Along with the portraits, uh, I was working on a body of photographs that were originally known as the boring photographs or the boring landscapes. And I've subsequently acquired the title of uh, Landscapes Without Incident. And what you've got to remember about this particular body, those, those particular photographs, is that they were very much a response uh, against the kind of beautiful photographs that were predominant at the time. The photographs of Ansel Adams, Western, uh, the photographs that were the accepted canon of photographic practice. Essentially, picturesque photographs were photographs that make the world look beautiful. And if you live in Stourbridge, Stourbridge isn't like the Yosemite Valley, uh, doesn't have a beautiful beach, uh, occasionally we get sunsets, but you've actually got to come to terms with the world that you live in. You've got to come to terms with it. Every Friday night you'd go down to Waitrose, down at the car park, down the same lift, you you walk or drive past uh, factories, you drive on the dual carriageway to Hagley. And so these photographs are actually about the world that we live in. And they were quite deliberately taken using flat light, eye level, um, quite unspectacular, and taken almost as if you were the first person to encounter the dual carriageway or the lift doors at Waitrose, or indeed even the bed. So in that sense, they are, in a kind of a way, archetypal, almost like the paintings of uh, Julian Opie, you know, the road paintings of that particular painter. The substations as a, as a, as a group of photographs, I think, were taken in 1973 or 1974. Um, and the reason I started taking substations was because they, probably more so than any other aspect of the urban environment, in terms of their importance, are the most invisible parts of the urban environment. They're these windowless boxes, and without them there would be no domestic electric supply. And they're hidden on estates, they're, they're kind of scattered all over the towns. Uh, and I started taking photographs of substations. And in a kind of a way, it, it links with the business of um, the boring photographs. You've got to come to terms with the world that you live in. Uh, you're not in Yosemite National Park. You're not even in the Lake District or the beauties of Snowdonia. You're in the West Midlands. You've got to come to terms with houses and housing estates and substations and roads and dual carriageways, lift doors, beds, furniture shops, shop windows, the kind of world that we live in. So substations really are just a part of that. But quite interestingly, they're a part that most photographers overlook because they're not picturesque, they're not beautiful, and they're not, they're not interesting. At, at, at the same time that I, was, that I was taking portraits and taking the boring photographs, in 1973 I took a series of ten photographs that have since become known as the Ten Televisions. Uh, and they're really photographs of televisions in people's houses in Stourbridge. And the television is in the middle of the, uh, of the photograph. Uh, the screen is dead. Uh, uh, so you've got these elements of, of still life around the, uh, the televisions themselves. I tried to do a number of series of photographs in the 70s, um, I mean, I tried uh, and started doing a series of Santa Clauses and, and regrettably only ever managed to do two. And I, of course, did the series on substations. But I suppose the televisions are uh, the most interesting um, because they're a complete set now. And what's interesting about them is that in the context of the interiors, the interiors that the portraits were set in, the, te the televisions almost look like something that is alien, that it's kind of landed in the middle of this uh, 
domestic setting. And it's quite interesting, I can remember at the time thinking, well, should the image, should, should the televisions have been on or should they not? But anyhow, the, uh, the decision was taken that they would be taken so that the image, the screen is dead. I mean, I've subsequently moved into painting uh, and that's what I do at the moment. So what's interesting about this exhibition is that these photographs are, or they were taken by someone who is no longer around. Um, I don't regard them as being mine in a strange kind of way. And so I look at them and I'm still excited by them, not because they were taken by me, but because I think that some of the portraits, um, the young girl, the boy with the football, the two snooker players, Mr and Mrs Seaborn, the girl in the hood, Mr Jackson, they still excite me. But they excite me because... I come across them um, almost with a kind of a neutral eye. I don't have any invested kind of personal ownership in them anymore. And that's what's really strange about them. And I think that that was strange about the way that I worked at the time. That I was working on my own. Uh, they were not being made for publication or exhibition. They were made because I was excited in taking photographs. I was excited in the discovery um, of photography at the time. Uh, the 1970s was the great period when all of these great photography books were being published. Books on Diane Albus, Sander, Lewis Hine, The Americans, Jackson, etc. And so really, uh, that was my response to this kind of real explosion of interest in photography in the 1970s. People like Eugene Agier, the French photographer, and there were many others. Um, and so when I look back on the work now, um, I think, well, yeah. Um, if people enjoy some of the work as much as I do, then uh, I think that's pretty good. <laughs>